We're going to turn to Luke chapter 5. And then we're going to read verses 3 and 4. Luke chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Are we ready? Amen. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. May God add a rich blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Uh, it's thrilling this morning to have Pastor Ramiro Cano here. He's our conference president for the Central California Conference. He's here to speak to us this morning. But you know, it says Paul Harvey says the rest of the story. He's been married 42 years to Mary Ellen, and Mary Ellen's right here. I just saw, there she is. 42 years to Mary Ellen, and he, Patricia's here, and she's a teacher at Foothill with her children. Amen. And uh, God is so, so good. But I want to tell you a little bit about Pastor Cono's background, because we kind of look at a conference president and go, from a baby they've been a conference president, right? I mean, th that's who they are. But really, Pastor Cano started the first 18 years of his professional life as an executive in the corporate world. And so he worked in the corporate world uh, for 18 years, and while he was having his own worship, going to church with his family, reaching out, participating in the local church, God was calling him into the ministry, and he gave up his work in the corporate world not to become a pastor, but to go back to school and to get his degree in ministry. And so he spent, as Pastor Cano says, he did it the hard way with a family and children and back in school. And uh, when he got his, uh, his uh, ministerial degree, he went on and, and uh, accepted a college, uh, accepted a call to the Texaco Conference in Texas where he spent 10 years a ministering in Texas, and then California called. New Mexico. Oh, is that New Mexico? New Mexico? New Mexico, and then, and then California, Central California Conference, put out a call to Pastor Cano, and he left to become the the uh, minister at the Milpitas Church, and he was there for six years, and then he accepted a call into the conference office where he was the executive uh, secretary for seven years, and then called to be the pastor, the head elder, the, uh, the president of the Central California Conference, where he has served for four years, and I'm fortunate enough to, to serve on the executive committee with him. So I'm thrilled to have Pastor Cano here to, to, to not only bring us our message this morning, but also lead us after church, after potluck, in talking about pastor selection. So welcome the, the Cano family with me this morning. As I hear all those years, it makes me sound old. <laughs> Boy, start do, don't do the math, will you? <laughs> it's a little depressing. I, it, and yet, quite a blessing, really, uh, to be still able to wake up in the morning and put our feet on solid ground. That's a blessing, isn't it? I believe I've been in this church before. But I don't think so in this pulpit. Uh, so it is an honor and privilege to be with you. As I scan the landscape, I see faces that I know. I may not know your names, but I know your faces. Some of those faces. I see one right now that I'm just now honing in on. Um, Trying to remember your name, Risenberger. No, right? David, David Risenberger. Yes, yes. Served us for quite a while. Um, glad to see you and many others. Bonnie and well, I'm gonna get into trouble now. Start naming names. <laughs> you know, camp meeting is coming, and I know we'll see your faces too. You have the well, I was gonna say the blessing of being nearby, but maybe that's a curse. I don't know. 
where maybe the church gets emptied out, maybe. So, you do. You close out. Well, praise the Lord for the support of camp meeting. Amen. Amen. You know, the conference is not just camp meeting. For some of you, it may be just this annual event that we do, and that's the concept that you have of the conference. The conference actually is made up of 138 churches, hoping to organize more. Um, there are several church plants and congregations that are preparing to be organized. We also have 29 schools, by God's grace. We also have in our territory, not that it's managed by us, but we do sit on those boards, we have three hospital systems, Adventist Health. We also have a couple of camps. We have, as you know, Soquel Conference Center, and then we have Wawona, right smack in the Yosemite National Park. And I notice in your welcoming pictures that you do avail yourselves of the beauty of Yosemite. I was actually there, I believe it was three weeks ago, and I actually took pictures of that very scene that you have here. And you have several with the falls, and you show Half Dome and, and all of that. It is a beautiful, beautiful place. And we believe that it is sacred ground, Wawona and Soquel and Monterey Bay Academy and Santa Cruz and so many wonderful pieces of properties uh, that God has allowed our, us to, to acquire by your uh, blessing. Uh, you know, the conference doesn't produce anything. You know that, right? Some people think that we produce things over there, money, in fact. And I'm sure some of you this afternoon will remind us of, or will actually be asking for some of that, perhaps. I hear some rumors, anyways. Um, but we don't produce anything. What we do is manage that which doesn't belong to us. We manage what belongs to you, to all of us, really, as stewards of really the real owner, which is capital O, owner of the universe. And so we, we feel it a, a tremendous weight and responsibility to make sure that we are managing uh, God's vineyard as faithful servants. Um, as I go around the conference, and I do go around all over the place, in fact, on Tuesday evening, I was in Milpitas. Um, in... Uh, Let's see, Wednesday, I was in San Francisco. The previous Sabbath, I was in Oakhurst. Uh, some of you were, I believe, members there. Um, and uh, next week, I'm going to be in Lindsay in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I will be in Shafter. <laughs> you know, some people think that I see a face I know from Milpitas. Wow, How, what a blessing. Um, Rodica, yes. Romanian. <laughs> See, it's good for me to practice my brain. Sometimes I, 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 I forget. I forget things. So when I remember things, it's hallelujah time. <laughs> All right? Some of you will know what I'm talking about. Um, so anyways, I will tell you, this is my calendar. I have not transmitted it to my smartphone. I'm still doing it this way. And uh, however, pretty soon it might just go digital. Uh, I am being urged by many folk to go digital. And, but I want to tell you that I don't drive it. It drives me. And my wife knows this very well. Um, this manages my life, the calendar. And it's quite uh, busy, um, but what an honor and privilege to be serving the Lord in these solemn times that we are living in. Um, and as my daughter is walking out of the place, being urged by her little one, I have to tell you all what a blessing it is to be able to be up here with a little rose also. I was not expecting that. This is a true gift for me. Um, and uh, my family knows that this is truly a, a, a blessing. I have so many things to tell you, 
And I am told that you are not watchers of the clock. Am I right? I hear many voices. I'm not sure that I can hone in on the... <laughs> Maybe it's better that I don't hone in on... Okay. Um, I have so many things to tell you. I will try not to keep you beyond 2 o'clock. No, no. Actually, I was told that it was okay to go to 1. Is that all right? I will try very hard to even go earlier than that. But it is my job not to keep you asleep. If I see somebody with their mouth open, ah, okay, then that's what this is for. I can walk around, okay? Um, I remember preaching in Milpitas, and um, I developed a habit that whenever I saw someone beginning to nod off, I would begin to move around in the pulpit. And I do remember one individual, I'm, this is just a warning, okay, because I do see you. <laughs> he was with his arms like this, head back, mouth open. I had this tremendous urge to laugh, but then I thought, no, I may be actually revealing my own lack. So anyways, if I do, I take it very personal if I put you to sleep. I just want you to know that. Um, am I putting enough pressure on you? <laughs> anyways, um, I have been blessed already by what I have experienced in this church by your testimony when you got up. What is your name? Eunice. Praise God for the ministry of education and the fact that there are lives, young tender lives that are being mentored and, and trained and receiving leadership, uh, training, not just for here but for all of eternity and hopefully there will be fruitful individuals in our society for the King. Are there any teachers here? Will you please stand? Um, thank you. And since my daughter once again is standing, so she gets to stand too because she is a teacher. Um, she's a seventh and eighth grade teacher there in our school in Foothill in Milpitas. Let me just say this to you. Teachers, you are, listen, you are ministers of the gospel. Your pulpit is your desk. In fact, you have more congregation time than the pastor. And I want you to know that for us in the conference office, we are constantly praying for you, praising God for you, um, and considering you as a very intricate part of, of the overall ministry without you we would have no church in fact as I go through the vault and I look at the minutes and the you know our conference is hundred and four years old it was organized back in 1911 and when I go through the vault I do this every once in a while uh, in order to sort of balance my head you know uh, kind of center me again to recognize the fact that I didn't build this that it really will do okay without me. I am the 19th president of this 104 year uh, journey and yet I find that there are churches that were here even before we were organized. They were part of the California conference. And in fact I noticed that there were some churches that came after the school was established in that local vicinity or, or community. School first, then church. So when you do a little bit of study, and in fact, um, your pastor, ex-pastor, Joe Reynolds, um, is a historian. And he will, I have a thick book like that of what he did with Soquel, and he's got a lot of information. I hope you have availed yourselves of the blessing. I have a wall in my, in my office. I should have brought a picture. You know, I'm into pictures and showing people because I believe that pictures show, uh, speak a, a thousand words and many sermons. I've been working for an entire year to decorate a wall in my office. 
The reason for that wall is because I wanted to prepare it to hang all the black, not all, I wish I had a wall that big, but many of the black and white pictures that we have in our vault. It depicts all of the heroes of the faith. As we look at those black and white pictures of Sokel, the camp meeting, I have a picture that is about this wide, about this, one of those long ones, 1913, camp meeting. I, uh, I'm humbled by it, and I often go in and I hone in on the faces, even though I don't know them, but I know Jesus does, and they're recorded in those books. And I thank God for them, because what we have here today is because of those folk, the faithfulness of those folk. This church was because of the faithfulness of those black and white picture folk, if you know what I mean. Let me also say that, um, oh, and I want to put, I haven't done it yet, but on top I have many of those pictures scattered in that wall. And it is really for me and for the employees that come into my office and visitors. And I remind everyone that you are part of a chain, a chain of faithful people. And our job is to be faithful during this window of time and that we may present it to the next whoever it is if the Lord so wishes and if he hasn't come yet. I just want you to know who I am and what makes me tick. I, I'm humbled by it and feel a tremendous responsibility and privilege to be part of that chain. When I was executive secretary for seven years, it was my job to keep track of the vital records of the conference and in fact put together the minutes of the executive committee. Uh, uh, Hugh Seagraves is now part of that. Uh, um, he's a member of the executive committee. And so it was my job for seven years to keep track of the minutes and to file them. They become part of the permanent record and now they sit in the vault. You know how, how solemn it is for me to go into the vault pick out the first binder, several of those minutes are done by hand. You know some of the names that are on there? W.C. White. And when you look at all the binders and to find that my binders are also there, along with this chain, mentioning actions that were taken, and if I look long enough, I would find actions that dealt with Santa Cruz. God is leading his church, and he will see to it that it will go through to the promised land. By the way, I haven't started my sermon yet. <laughs> I <Yeah>, just wait. <laughs> I do also want to tell you this is not part of my sermon. Do you realize, and I appreciated the children's story. I could have actually changed my sermon as a result of what happened here with the children's story. Thank you, brother. Do you realize that the society today that we're living in, which is quite dysfunctional, is because of the absence of fathers? A great majority of that is because of that. But I think society and Satan has been working overtime to, to make sure that the priest, the priest or the head of household uh, is not present. Do you know that there was a study made in a prison? I haven't started my sermon yet. <laughs> in a prison where during Mother's Day they gave out Mother's Day cards for the inmates to send to their mothers. They ran out of inventory. They did the same thing with Father's Day. The inventory was left without much impact to the inventory. Do you know that back in the day you know, now it's a little different because of the telephone technology and fiber optics and so on. But it wasn't too long ago that during Mother's Day, the switchboards, do you ever remember, um, there's not enough load, I forget what it would say, but it, there's not enough room 
to, to you know, go back and make the call later. Do you remember that? It hasn't been too long ago. I would say maybe within the last five years, ten years. Why? The switchboards were full of all the phone calls that are being made during Mother's Day. That is not the case with Father's Day. So to be acknowledged with a flower, church, this is very meaningful to a father. From a father, I'm telling you, this is huge. Do you realize that I stop when I recognize some of these things? I could tell you my story and it would tie up your entire day. But I do have to tell you, I'll leave this, this one part. Because I want to acknowledge fathers. Society has pretty much relegated men to the sideline. And it begins from the very beginning. When my daughter was born, and I, she was, she's here. She's my firstborn. You realize that when I, I was very young, uh, she was born in Kaiser Hospital in Southern California. When my wife was in the um, labor room, I was there with her. But, from, but at the time that my daughter was ready to be born, they kicked me out of the room because fathers were not allowed to be in the delivery room. You all remember that? I was kicked out. So when my daughter, the news of my daughter being born, and when we got her home, I can tell you that it was, a, forgive me, Patricia, for saying this, but I live with this. It was as if I went to the store and bought a gallon of milk. <laughs> it's sad that I, as a father, and I have to make amends here, and I've been making amends to my daughter, I think, all her life. I'm not going to tell you your age. I understand that that's a sensitive issue. <laughs> but, but, oops, they might kind of know because I told them how long we've been married. Um, anyways, let's go aside. <laughs> Flip to the next channel. Anyways, um, so they didn't allow me. In other words, I found out the, what they had robbed me. In fact, I got very upset when my son was born. Antonio, I have two sons. But Antonio, the second one, who's now pastor in Turlock, um, when he was born, and they allowed me at that time to be present, I got very upset because of what they had robbed me of my daughter. It was such an excitement, immediate bonding. And, and I, I, if I could just hit the rewind bo button and be able to go back and recapture what they had robbed me of with my daughter. Then I began to look at society as to how it relegates men as a second class citizen in the home. From the moment that kids are born already, well, even prior to that, when they get married, have you noticed how we do weddings? In fact, I changed totally. How I, if, if you want me to marry you, there are conditions. And the condition is, now, in the normal traditional way, when, a, when, when the wedding starts, you know, the, the man or the groom walks in through the side. In fact, there is no changing of the music. There is no standing up of the congregation. There is no acknowledgement. All of a sudden, you know, you may be talking or reading. And all of a sudden, oh, there he is. Right? Oh, but when the woman, the bride, comes in, the double doors open. Pedals are thrown in the center. The music changes. The people stand up. And the father walks her in. Excuse me. Didn't the boys have, didn't the parents have just as much to do with the boy than they did with the girl? Do you see what I'm saying? So from that point on, I began to say to folk, and I practice this with my kids because I've married all three of them. Both will walk through the center. People will stand for the groom as well. And the music will change. And the parents of the groom will also walk him in. 
What are we trying to do with that? To acknowledge the fact that they are central to the whole idea of the home. And it begins from the very beginning. Just a little nugget to say, Happy Father's Day to the fathers. That's what you did, Patricia, by giving me this today. You rewound the button and threw me back. I almost shed a tear up there, and I'm trying to keep my composure because i got to get up here and preach. But this is very significant to me. Thank you, Santa Cruz. Let's begin the sermon. I will try to go very fast. I would ask you to turn to Luke chapter 5. Why did I take off my watch? I have a big clock up there. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. You know the story. I pray and I hope that you will embrace what I believe is one more lesson that I think we can learn. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 11, it says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to what? To hear. I'm, I'm reading from the King James Version. To hear the word of God. He stood by the lake of Genezareth, which is the Sea of Galilee, and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. What were they doing? They were washing their nets, and he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he should, what? Thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Whose ship was that? Simon Peter's. Verse 4, now when he had left speaking, when he was done with his sermon, and I'm sure it went beyond one o'clock, now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, What? Lodge out where? Into the deep. So first thrust out a little, and then thrust out into the deep waters. Right? And let down your nets for a drought or a catch. Verse 5. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had... This done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes in their net break. And when they beckoned un unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them, and they came and filled both sh the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter, what? Saw it. He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the drought of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they did what? They forsook all and followed him. I need to read to you a dream from Ellen White. It is found in Life Sketches, pages 208 and 209, also in the letter 23-1874. On the night of April 1, as a dream was given to Ellen White, she wrote, I dreamed that several of the brethren in California were in council considering the best plan for labor during the coming season. Some thought it wise to shun the large cities and work in smaller places. My husband was earnestly urging that the larger cities and work, no, I'm sorry, my husband was earnestly urging that broader plans be laid and more extended efforts be made, which would better compare with the character of our message. So there was a meeting in California. There was a council. Brethren, leaders, they were gathered together to try to ponder upon how to work 
California. Well, we're in California last time I looked. All right? And we're constantly having meetings and committees about how to work the cities. Then a young man, which I had frequently seen in my dreams, came into the council. He listened with interest to the words that were spoken, and then speaking with deliberation and authoritative confidence said, The cities and villages constitute a part of the Lord's vineyard. They must hear the messages of warning. You are entering two limited ideas of the work for this time. So this young man in, in the dream there with Ellen White, she saw him saying to the brethren, you are being too limited in your planning. Then it says that at the quarterly meeting that began in Bloomfield on April 24, Ellen urged the workers not to pitch their tents in the smallest areas or the smallest places. <laughs> Writing to Edson and Emma. Edson was her son. Emma was Edson's wife. So she was writing a letter about the meeting. And she said, and this is what I want you to read. Oh, can you put me, oh, I don't have it up here? No? I'll read it down here. All right. So the sermon title is, Launch Out Into the Deep. But here is what I want you to hone in on. In the letter she wrote, we wish to know whether they would hug the shore or launch out into the deep and let down their nets for a drought of fish in the deep waters. We have a great and important work before us. She connected the work in California and the plans that were going on or being drawn out to Luke chapter 5. She wants to know. I want to know whether they will continue to hug the shore. Now, we're here in Santa Cruz. You're very familiar with the shore. So this is going to be very much coming home for you. When I go preach this in other places, you know, I may be in Yosemite or I may be in the valley where there is no shore. But they seem to get it. You really ought to get this one. <laughs> I want to know. I'm not Ellen White. But I want to know, will you hug the shore or launch out into the deep? I believe that this story talks about the journey of the Christian. In fact, let me just give you a little backdrop here. The disciples had already walked with Jesus for a year and a half. So you need to put that in context of what we're reading and what we're speaking of here today. There already had been the baptism of Jesus. He had already been in the desert for 40 days. He had already done the miracle in the wedding at Cana. He turned the water into wine. He also had already turned over, you know, the tables there as he was cleansing the temple. He already had had the encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. John the Baptist was in prison, and this is Jesus' cousin. Um, he also had already uh, healed there at the pool of Bethesda. He had already visited Nazareth where they tried to kill him. And he also had already healed Peter's mother-in-law. This is the context. They had already walked with Jesus for a year and a half. Now, notice in the story that we don't know what Jesus preached. See, there's times when that's not the consequential thing. It is what Jesus did. Now, I believe that there are four stages, and I call them the four C's. It says that the crowd pressed upon him when he got to the beach, to the shore. You will not read this, but I know you will agree with me that not everybody 
came to the shore that day. That some folk stayed home. Would you agree with that? In fact, I believe that there are several members of this church that are not here today. And by that, I'm not placing judgment. Don't misunderstand me. Sometimes it's okay to be home. Well, no. It's okay for you to stay home anytime. All the time, really. It's okay. But I want you to see where you are depending on the motive and the reason why you stay home. So I want you to see yourself in this story. I'm not going to tell you where you are. You're going to tell yourself where you're at. Okay? And you deal with the Lord on that one. Okay? So those that stayed home, this is the first C, and I call it the C of complacency. The, C, uh, the word complacency means self-satisfied. It means content. Some will be just home because they're content with their life. You know, good job good toys in the garage, they live a good life, they have need of anything, they're even members of the church, and they come Father's Day maybe to get a flower, I, I don't know, or whenever you have a funeral, or, you, you know, anyways, I can go on about that one. Then there is the second C. There is the C of those that actually came to the shore. This I call the C of curiosity. I'm wondering, I don't know if I should say this. No, I will because it's in my heart and I want to be honest. I'm wondering if some of you here came here today just because you're curious to see what the president looks like. <laughs> yeah, I never heard him preach. I wonder how he preaches. Well, I'm just saying. You know? Uh, should I go on on that one? Anyway, so some came to see Jesus that day because, oh, if you read in Desire of Ages, you'll find out that Jesus, at this point in time of his ministry, he was front page news. He was very popular. This is why the throng came and they were pressing upon him. And then there's the third seat. You know, Jesus saw the fishermen. He saw two ships or two boats. And... He asked Peter, I need your boat. I need to use your boat and use it as a pulpit. And so Peter was very willing to cooperate with Jesus. So the third C is the C of cooperation. All right? Now, some of you are elders, deacons, whatever you are, and praise God for your service, because, you know, this church really cannot run with paid workers. By the way, I'll remind you of that this afternoon at 2 o'clock. <laughs> Just put, tuck that away. The church does not run by paid workers. It runs by its volunteers. That's the New Testament model. That was just a parenthesis. Anyways, and then, so you notice that Jesus said to Peter, launch out a bit. Remember? Just launch out a bit, you know, just enough to, to wet your ankles. I, I'm not going to ask you to just go all the way to the deep all of a sudden. No, I'm going to do this in stages. I'm going to do this in stages. So now, Peter, feeling very good about cooperating with Jesus. Some of you may feel very good about the fact that today you put your tithe in your helping, in your cooperating. Or that when the pastor called you last night, you know, maybe Hugh, uh, you know, pastor called you and he said, you know, would you please introduce the president? Oh, I'd be happy to cooperate. Uh, forgive me for using you. Um, but, you know, for those that are going to participate up here, you're cooperating. But Jesus now says to Peter, I want you to go to the fourth phase. Let's go fishing. Let's go to the fourth phase, and I call that the sea of commitment. And so we said then that because Jesus was at the height of his reputation, I found this picture, and I thought, hmm, I wonder if that's how it looked. You know, the people just, just, Jesus is in town. Not the president, but Jesus is in town, you know, see. And so many people came. And so Jesus, it tells us there that he was being pressed. 
And so he, in a, in a way, he was being pressed and pushed. And he says, Peter, I need your boat. I need your boat. But notice also that it says that when Jesus came, he noticed he must have been there for a while. In fact, he must have showed up early. If you read Desire of Ages, it says that the entire night, the disciples, did, or the fishermen, let's call them that, did not catch anything. It was an extremely frustrating night. In fact, it says that they reviewed their life. They were even wondering about this man called Jesus. How is it that his cousin is still in prison and he has done nothing about it? How is it that we can go to Nazareth and they're already trying to kill him? How is it that this master of ours cannot win the sympathy of the priests and the church leaders? So everything seemed to be failing that night. Not only their own profession, the fish, but also now following Jesus. It says that when Jesus came, he noticed that they were cleaning their nets. See, this was now the morning. Fishing with a net happens at night. Why? Because the waters are cool and the fish comes to the top to, fish from, oh, to eat from the top, from the surface. And so they see Jesus. Jesus sees them. They're cleaning their nets. By the way, the nets have to be cleaned while they're still wet. Otherwise, it would be a very hard thing to do to clean the nets because they become stiff, right? And so they need it to be done. And so no doubt that the fishermen were hoping to get the work done as quickly as possible. They were tired. They were hungry. They wanted to go home, have breakfast, go to bed, relax, and shed their frustration for my very fruitless, fruitless night. And then Jesus says, Peter, I need your help. I need your boat. I need to borrow your boat. Please help me. Launch out a bit. Do you hear Peter saying anything at this point? He doesn't say a word. He's silent. In other words, he's very willing to cooperate. He's very willing to say yes. He's very willing to help Jesus. Now the disciples had already been convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the Messiah, and they had followed him, and they had witnessed already, you know, his miracles. They had seen, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, turning water into wine and so on and so forth. Notice what Ellen White says. So he did preach from the boat. But notice in Desire of Ages, page 246. Until this time, none of the disciples had fully united as co-laborers with Jesus. They had walked with him a, a year and a half, as I mentioned. So the question for you this morning is, oh, actually it's afternoon now. <laughs> How long have you walked with Jesus? It says that up until this time, they had not fully united as co-laborers with Jesus. They had witnessed many of his miracles and had listened to his teachings, but they had not entirely forsaken their former employment. In other words, they were kind of in the periphery, not really wanting to get themselves too committed. In other words, so far, they had launched out a bit. Do you get the correlation? They had launched out a bit. I am convinced that Jesus that day showed up. Not so much to preach a sermon, although of course he did, and I'm sure many were touching, got converted as a result. But the main reason why he came that day was to take his disciples to the fourth level. They 
were not truly convinced that this was truly an investment that was worthwhile. And so Jesus is preaching. Peter is right there, by the way, in the boat. And I can just see Jesus preaching, Peter watching him. Yeah, I wonder how much longer this sermon's going to go. You know, I have to eat, you know, my breakfast, even though it's lunchtime now, and this thing is going long. I'm tired. Then all of a sudden, Jesus says there, what we see there in verse 4, when he says, thrust out a little from the land. And then he, when he was done with his sermon, he says, launch out into the deep and let down your nets. Now, this is not the time to, to, to fish. In fact, we notice that the entire morning, Peter had not said anything. I believe, I believe that Peter gave Jesus attitude here. Now, have you ever gotten attitude from anyone? Sometimes our children, you know, will step over the line and give us attitude. Sometimes members give pastors attitude. Sometimes people give the president attitude. Yes, they do. I can recognize attitude either by body language, tone of voice, or silence, or too much. Too much talk. <laughs> Peter here had to say something. Fishing? Now? In the heat of the day? I have just cleaned the nets? Who are you? A carpenter? Telling a fisherman when to go, where to go, what time of the day to fish in? Well, I just got to say something. Now remember, fishing was Peter's profession. It had been in the family business for generations. I got to say something. I could just hear John and James, you know, the sons of Zebedee. You know they had to say something, you know, the sons of thunder. Peter, will you please tell them something? We just cleaned the nets. It's no time to go fishing now. We're tired. And so in verse 5, listen. Sometimes I wish the Bible would come with, uh, with audio. Yes. Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken mm -mm, nothing, nothing. I could just see Peter speaking like that to Jesus. But, nevertheless, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. I can just see the, you know, the, 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 the facial expression. You know, you know about attitudes. You don't do that, huh? No, because you went through VHM. <laughs> right? I'm not going to ask my mom or... Anyways, attitudes... I'll go ahead, Lord. I will let down the nets. You know the story. They gather fish, a lot of fish, so much fish that it was breaking the nets, so much fish that now they had to get help. Peter had to get help from their buddies. And in fact, it says that the two boats were now beginning to sink. There was so much fish. And so it says... There in verse 8, when Peter saw this, my question to you, what did Peter see? Now, in the, in the reading of the story, you would think that he saw the fish, right? I don't believe that that's what he saw. It says that when Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now my question is, why hadn't he dropped to Jesus' feet before? Why didn't he drop to his knees and say, He can turn the water into wine? Why didn't he do it when he was healing there at the pool of Bethesda? Why didn't he do it when he really came home where he healed his own mother-in-law? 
Why hadn't Peter recognized who he was, Jesus? You know, Peter, again, was a disciple. But thus far in his relationship with Jesus, he had only ventured out a bit. Jesus was calling Peter to go into the deeper waters of his spiritual experience. Where are you at? In fact, I will say to you that all night long, Peter was in deep waters already. Huh? Isn't that the way we talk also when we have problems? Financial problems, physical problems, relationship problems. We will say, man, I am in deep water. Right? We use that as a term. And I will say to you that Peter that night, in a very unsuccessful night for a professional fisherman, was in deep water. What is the difference now? He's in deep water again in the morning. What was the difference now? Jesus is in the boat. Are you in deep water? Is Jesus in the boat? Well, maybe you've been watching other Christians, you know, from the shore. As they go fishing, and all you see when they come home is empty nets. You know, when the Bible worker goes out, and when they go knocking on doors, when they do the glow from, you know, tracks all over the place, and all you see is empty nets coming home. People tired of their toil in their evangelistic efforts. The Lord says to us this afternoon, I should say morning because it just keeps reminding you of how late it is. I believe the Lord is telling you and me, stop hugging the shore. How long will we continue to hug the shore? But remember, when you go to the deep waters, make sure that you take Jesus with you because every overflow, every fishing experience when Jesus is in the boat will always lead to overflow. <clears throat> Peter had witnessed many miracles. <clears throat> what was the difference now? None of the year and a half experience between Peter and Jesus had caused him to drop down to his knees. So what is it that he saw? I believe that he saw himself. He saw his own lack. He saw that this Jesus, that he was trying to be cooperative with, you know, Peter was feeling quite satisfied that he was giving him his money, he was letting him use his, his boat, he was giving him his time, even though he was tired, he was sacrificing. And in fact, I know that you and I, will feel the same thing when the pastor or when something happens here at the church and you truly sacrifice all of those things. You sacrifice money. You sacrifice time. You sacrifice your own tools. You sacrifice your own car. You sacrifice your own family. You sacrifice anything, everything for the Lord. I say to you today that that is just launching out a bit and you're being very good in cooperating and Jesus is coming to Santa Cruz today to say, let's go fishing. In the deep waters. Peter was feeling quite spiritual and focusing mainly on what he could do for Jesus. But today in this story, he found out and he realized that Peter had nothing to give to Jesus. But it was Jesus who had all to give to Peter. Who is this Jesus? who commands the fish to come to the net at the wrong time of the day? Who is this Jesus who has his finger on nature? You see, Christ's presence inspires faith. Christ's presence inspires hope. And Christ's presence also instills a feeling of helplessness and distrust in one's own efforts. And it is then, and only then, that we can drop down to our knees and say, as Isaiah, Isaiah said, 
woe is me, for I am undone. A man of unclean lips. Have you and I, in our spiritual walk and journey, come to the point where you come and say, woe is me. You drop down to your feet or to your knees, to the very feet of Jesus. In verse 11, in verse 11, something happened here. It says there in verse 11 that when the boats were, went back to shore, they did what? They left everything. Now, perhaps you and I don't have a boat. Maybe some of you do out here. <laughs> I don't. And you may not have a boat you want to leave or that you need to leave. But you know what? You and I have something we need to leave. Something that is keeping us from that deep water experience. You know that day Jesus went fishing and he caught a big one. Peter. The first sermon, Peter caught 3,000. The Lord is calling you and I this morning to launch out into the deep, of water, of the deep waters of faith. You see, it is in the deep waters where Jesus wants to take us. It is in the deep waters where you realize God's divinity and your own unholy humanity. It is in the deep waters where you realize that you really have nothing to offer Jesus, but it is Jesus who has everything to offer you. It is in the deep waters where you come to the end of yourself, you realize your own lack, and come face to face with God's power, His mercy, and His love. It is in the deep waters where you realize who you are working for. Jesus, the creator God. It is in the deep waters where the fish respond to the call of the fishermen. And it is in the deep waters where you decide to leave everything to follow Jesus. Like Peter said, at thy word I will let down the net. You may not realize that it may not make sense to you like it didn't make sense to Peter. But at thy word, I will let down the net. The results will always be miraculous. We have been called to be fishers of men. I want you to see here in that verse where it says to catch, in verse 10. It says there, fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. You know that word catch means zogreo. In Greek. Listen. That word means zogreo in Greek. That's where we get the English word zoo. Yeah. When the fishermen fish and they catch a fish, they kill the fish. And the next step is to clean the fish, right? Jesus is saying, I want you to be fishers of men, but I want you to do it the Zogreo style. The Zogreo way. You know what Zogreo means? Catch them alive. You catch them, I'll clean them. Did you get that? Since when did the Seventh-day Adventist... Church become the cleaners of the fish. Think about that. A new member comes in, and the first thing we want to do is clean them. Oh, we know exactly how they ought to eat. We know exactly how they ought to read. We know exactly how they ought to dress. We know exactly how to clean them. Brothers and sisters, our job is to catch them. It is Jesus who cleans them, and he will use you to educate. Live the life that will speak louder than any word you might. By the way, I, I remember in Milpitas, and it hurts me to this day. I remember we were working, the, this grandmother came to me crying 
because her two granddaughters had showed up for the first time in church. She had been praying for a long time for these two daughters. They showed up with very, very short dresses. Beautiful girls. They hadn't made it to the pew. And somebody had already gone to clean them. They never showed up again. Will you please stop? Stop! I think every church ought to smell like smoke. Do you get what I'm trying to say, tell you? It ought to be a place where the doors are open for the sinner, for the sick. And if they're smoking, if they're drinking, if they're whatever condition, they are welcome in this church. Amen. And by the grace of God, by and by, they will reflect the character of Jesus. Amen. But first, you've got to show them what Jesus looked like. You get that, what I'm trying to say. Amen. By the way, and I've been telling folk this, I do have five more minutes. <laughs> I've been telling people to stop praying. I hope I am not misquoted, and I know maybe this is being recorded, so please don't take me out of context. Here's why I'm telling people to stop praying. Because when we pray for something and then the Lord responds, people begin to criticize how God responds. You know what? Stop praying. If you're not willing to accept how God is going to respond to your prayer. Oh, I just don't like the way he did it. We're asking that the Lord will turn the Bay Area upside down with bridges, you know, bridges, Bay Area for Jesus. Getting criticisms because people don't like the way the methods. And yet people are flocking and coming and getting interested in the Lord Jesus. Stop praying. Stop praying. You've got to trust how God... And I'm not talking about breaking standards or, or compromising. I'm not talking about compromising. There is a place where we need to stand and be heard. Okay? I'm not talking about those. I'm talking sometimes about, well, the Lord has called us to a deep water experience. The question for you today, this morning, what does a deep water commitment look like in your life? It may look different in mine. It will look different in yours. Don't be comparing with one another. Compare it with Jesus. I believe that we have been called to be fishers of men, not just keepers of the aquarium. Think about that. What do you do with an aquarium? You spend your whole life feeding and cleaning. And you make the fish think that that's the ocean. <laughs> huh? Right? We need to break the walls of the aquarium because there is a big ocean out there. You know, my wife and I, Marianne and I, we love to come out this way. And when we can, we love to go to Capitola or something. Just sit there. Just sit there. And watch the expanse of the ocean. It's a big ocean. Will you please stop putting limits to that ocean? The fish inside need to understand that they need to go outside and show what a gut fish looks like to the ocean fish. Huh? What does a deep water evangelistic experience look like I praise God for all of you here today I praise God for this church I praise God for what it has stood for and continues to stand for 
will you and me, in the solemn times that we're living in, once and for all, launch out into the deep? Will you stop hugging the shore? I wish to know, along with the prophet, whether they will hug the shore or launch out into the deep. May this be a launching out of the deep church until Jesus comes. We cannot do this alone. We need each other. We need John 17 to be practiced as we take this journey towards the promised land. The Lord will take his church. We will cross to the other side. Let us pray. Father, you are so loving. You love us so. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave. You gave your only son for us here today in this aquarium, but also for those in Santa Cruz, in its vicinity. Lord, would you please make us uncomfortable. Give us holy unrest. Help us to have that experience that Peter had in Isaiah, woe is me. Forgive us for our sin, for our lack. Forgive us, Lord, for being perhaps in the first sea of complacency or the sea of curiosity or the sea of cooperation. Thank you, Father, for your patience and for showing us today that you long to have us in a deep water experience. Will you do that for us individually and thus the whole church so that this lighthouse that we call Santa Cruz will shine brightly in this community and draw all men unto Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. He leadeth me, and number 537. It, before you start playing, Gary, I, we found a set of keys. And if you lost a set, come and see me afterwards. And number 537. Thank you.
in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the love yet that you demonstrate each and every day. Even in the midst of our mistakes, Father, you are there to pick us up. You are there to forgive. You are there, Lord, to take us to the promised land. You don't want none of us to be left behind. And Lord, for that we thank you. So Father, would you please help us to be better today than we were yesterday. And may that be the theme of each of our days, that we will keep climbing in the likeness of Jesus' character as we reflect him to the neighborhoods of this community. So be with this church, be with us as we continue on this journey towards heaven, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you.